Welcome to the lecture uh, for crisis intervention. I'm talking about chapter three of Aguilera, problem solving approach to crisis intervention. Uh, this is when we'll uh, start talking about Aguilera's model for, for intervention, actually start talking about what to do um, when presented with a crisis. Okay, so first some assumptions of a problem solving approach. Um, obviously with problem in the title, the problem is going to be uh, important here, and the assumption is that a problem, some problem uh, precedes a crisis. So the problem and the crisis aren't the same thing, but a crisis uh, results from uh, some problem that uh, that was presented, um, that the person was unable to resolve uh, on their own. <coughs> okay, so we start thinking, okay, well, what do we mean by a problem? If we look up, you know, problem in the dictionary, you know, let's say something that's difficult to solve or overcome. Uh, and that implies that the problem is something that blocks progress or impairs functioning. Um, something that keeps the person from, from moving forward or from functioning in the way that they um, want to or need to. And kind of extend the thinking along the lines of uh, this problem is blocking you, blocking you from getting somewhere, from doing something. It assumes that you want or need to get to the some other place or function in a way that's not, not possible. So a solution is needed. Um, the the person wants to move forward in a way that's just not possible because of the problem. Um, so to help clarify, if you see a train crash on TV and you decide you know never to ride a train again because you kind of develop this phobia of trains, right? Maybe a problem may not be a problem that leads to a crisis if you don't care about riding a train again. Right? If you have other means of transportation, not a big deal. Uh, if you work as a train conductor, this is definitely a problem and, and may result in a crisis. And we'll talk a little bit about what kind of factors will um, influence whether or not the inability to solve the problem results in a crisis. Okay, so obviously uh, this is a professional approach to helping people deal with um, problems. And so there's an assumption that the therapist is an expert um, problem solver. Uh, and again, it's not that uh, you have to solve the problem for them, but you have, to, you have to know enough about solving problems and kind of the logical sequence of events that occurs that you can guide them um, uh, through it. And with this particular um, problem-solving approach, uh, it's very much an, an emphasis on rationalism. Uh, and I put, you know, logic is the answer. Because there's an assumption that being good at solving problems involves being adept at engaging in logical reasoning. It kind of assumes that you can think your way to a solution as opposed to relying on intuition or superstition or luck. Okay, so we've covered the assumptions of, of the approach. So now let's talk a little bit about um, when do problems lead to uh, a crisis. Well, uh, one of the things that is uh, frequently accompanies a problem when you have something that you are trying to solve or overcome, there's some level of anxiety or stress, right, which has physiological, cognitive, affective components. Generally, it's some sort of discomfort. Um, and it, at moderate levels, this discomfort serves as motivation to solve the problem, right? And conversely, at very low levels, if there's no motivation to solve the problem, uh, if there's no anxiety, um, there's going to be no motivation to solve the problem, and it doesn't bother me, which may or may or may not be a good thing. If it's not really a significant problem, good thing. If it is a big problem, but you're not having enough anxiety about it, the problem may escalate into something worse later that will result in, in perhaps a, a large amount of anxiety. Uh, so moderate, good, low, maybe good, maybe not. And then uh, at very high levels of, of anxiety, high levels of stress, uh, the anxiety begins to interfere with our ability to solve problems uh, despite kind of the high motivation to ease discomfort um, and that has to do with the whole biological um, psychological interaction that it's harder to think um, and to think clearly and to access memories and to um, uh, act and act rationally uh, under periods of, of intense stress okay another thing that will influence whether or not a problem leads to a crisis is your assessment uh, of the problem <clears throat> so the, the, if, the if, if you take a reasonable logical view of a problem um, you're less likely to experience a crisis than if you have uh, an unrealistic view and the thinking here being that unrealistic uh, views of the problem will lead to um, uh, inappropriate emotional responses either not enough 
anxiety or stress or too much anxiety or stress. Right, and then uh, the next one would be uh, previous experiences. Uh, so if you've had, if you've solved similar problems in the past, probably not going to lead to a crisis. You can kind of pull up, pull on those experiences and uh, move forward. But if it's something that you've never faced before and kind of things you've done in the past don't fit this particular problem, now you 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 might um, be be at greater risk for experiencing a crisis. Uh, and then related to that would be skill level, you know, your skill at problem solving. And individuals differ with regard to how well they're able to logically work through uh, problems. And some of that skill level is probably based on experience, and some of it's probably based on other kind of innate factors uh, related to intelligence and just cognitive functioning. Um, okay, so keep these things in mind um, as we start to look at um, Aguilera's model. This is where we'll spend most of our time. Okay, so uh, the model, again, is, is uh, it's a paradigm for understanding why crises develop and how they can be uh, resolved. So you start off with a person who's in some state of equilibrium, right, which is an assumption of the model. Um, and remember we talked before about equilibrium being kind of like homeostasis, and it's not, uh, not like you're on a tranquil sea where nothing is happening, but you're at some, uh, some state of being where you're not too high, not too low in terms of um, uh, affect, um, physical activity, stress, all those things. You're in what that looks like uh, will differ across individuals. D different people have different types of equilibrium, uh, but it's kind of your typical level of functioning uh, associated with some range of you know emotional experiences. Uh, so you have, you start at some level of equi equilibrium, and then there's a stressful event. Right? And the stressful event, again, in a problem-solving uh, uh, model is some problem, something happens, and then this naturally leads to a state of disequilibrium. And this isn't uh, necessarily crisis yet. It's just, okay, you're going along, and then here's a new problem. You're thrown off a little bit. And, again, the assumption being that there's a need to restore equilibrium. And kind of the idea being that we have these built-in mechanisms that... Um, make us prefer stability and equilibrium and that we don't like being off-center. And so we, we're motivated to do something to get back to, to where we were. Okay, so what's going to determine, according to Aguilera, whether or not you're able to um, um, restore equilibrium, you know, get rid of the distress that's caused by the problem or return to some level of functioning that you've lost, uh, is the presence or absence of three types of balancing factors. Uh, and it's combinations of these factors that uh, um, seem to be important, but Aguilar doesn't specify exactly what combination is uh, optimal. And again, there's three things, and it's not, okay, if you, ha if you have all three, you're good. Uh, it's not, okay, if you have two that are high, one that's low, you're still good. Aguilar doesn't specify, it just says consider these things to help you figure out um, where to, to guide your intervention and the likelihood of somebody um, resolving a crisis. Okay, and before I, again, before I uh, point out what these three things are, it's important to note that uh, they're not independent factors. Each one uh, affects and is affected by the other. Okay, so let's look at the three things. The first being the perception of the event. So something we kind of already talked about in terms of um, when, uh, when might a problem uh, become a crisis. And for Aguilera, it's, you know, is it a realistic or unrealistic perception of the event? If it's realistic, then it's kind of a, a, a balancing factor is present. If it's unrealistic, then the balancing factor is not present, and you're more likely to experience crisis. Uh, and for me here, it's helpful to kind of uh, think about uh, Weiner's attribution theory and Seligman's theory of learned helplessness, which kind of uh, provides some, um, some background for how to think about perceptions of events. Um, so think about... Uh, locus of causality uh, being internal versus external <coughs> with the idea that um, when something uh, bad happens um, sometimes it can be uh, you can have unrealistic perception that it's uh, uh, that there's an internal cause that it's your fault when it when it's something that uh, wasn't your fault um, of course there may be things whenever you have an external locus of causality when it probably should be internal. So 
let's say you're um, some crisis resulting from a substance uh, a substance dependence problem, and you know your actions and behaviors are causing problems, but you externalize it and say, okay, well, um, it's uh, not my fault. It's the system who's against me that's causing uh, the crisis. So uh, where that locus of causality is and kind of where it uh, realistically uh, would be appropriate um, is important to try to figure out. And another thing with the perception of events, so we have locus of causality, uh, stability of kind of the negative event, is it, a, is it dynamic or stable? So the idea being that, okay, uh, this bad thing happened and it's always going to be this way, and then that would probably, probably be a, a, a distorted perception of the event. Few problems are, are permanent, um, you know, or, is, or do you have kind of more realistic dynamic view, okay, this bad thing happened, but it won't always be this way and things may get better. Uh, the next one, uh, looking at control. So, was the the problem, the negative event, controllable or uncontrollable? You know, so was it uh, completely random, or um, could it have been avoided? And again, depending on what the problem was, um, either one of these may be uh, uh, may be rational and appropriate. Um, a, a fourth uh, aspect uh, of the perception of the event to, to think about is um, specificity. So was kind of the cause of the, the negative event um, is specific or global. And this in, in terms of is it um, something bad happens, okay well uh, I got in this car accident and yeah okay now uh, uh, my car is, is busted up and that's going to cause me some problems with some money but you know my family still loves me and I wasn't hurt and I still have this opportunity so you get this kind of specific understanding of the event or is it uh, become kind of globalized where one bad thing happens and you begin to think okay the world is falling apart my car my car is busted up nothing's going right there's no point going on uh, life is hopeless right? and, and they're quite typically having kind of a specific understanding of exactly w what that negative event pertains to and limiting your thoughts about it to to one domain uh, is probably going to be uh, more rational and, and more helpful. Uh, and there's probably you know other important aspects as well that we can uh, talk about when we, when we get to class about uh, perception of the event and what might be a rational versus irrational uh, perception. You know, just think about all the stuff you've learned about cognitive psychology uh, so far. Uh, the main point here is just that the way people think about a stressful event plays a significant role in what emotional impact that event will have and in what their behavioral response to the problem will be. Okay, so uh, perception of event, one of the big bounce factors. Situational supports uh, being another one, and this is just whether they're adequate or inadequate. Uh, and this can be a lot of things. Uh, other people in the person's life, um, family and friends. Um, you can think about kind of uh, broaden your scope. Uh, economic factors, you know. Um, you know, is, when something bad happens, does this person have a job where they can take off from work and not get fired? You know, or if they take off to deal with one crisis, will that lead to another crisis? Um, community agencies and groups uh, that are available to help them. You know, the Red Cross, uh, places of worship, uh, legal aid. Uh, you know, in these uh, situation reports, um, whether they're present or absent is important. But it also depends on the quality uh, of the situation supports. So sometimes you, you might imagine that um, uh, certain situation supports, if they're there, okay, that's good. Sometimes if they're there, that might actually they might actually have a negative impact on the person. Uh, if you have, uh, oh, I have lots of uh, fam, live around lots of family, but if the family um, judges you negatively for whatever crisis you're involved with that may not be a source of support. So it's not as simple as are there people there or not, are there resources there or not. It's are there resources there that can be supportive of the person um, in their attempts to resolve this problem and uh, deal with the crisis. Uh, okay, the, the third one will be coping mechanisms. Uh, are they adequate or inadequate? And this is just obviously about, you know, what behaviors um, have they engaged in uh, before or can they engage in now? that might help them deal with either the problem or the negative affect generated by the problem. Uh, and, and these uh, coping mechanisms may vary in the degree to which um, their, uh, the behaviors are 
organized and goal directed in thinking about you know how efficient or effective they are. Uh, example of something that okay here's a coping strategy but it's not an effective one. You find out your kid has a drug problem. You spend hours and hours reading every detail about every treatment center in the U.S probably not a productive use of your time. So you're coping with it. I'm, I'm taking action to address the problem, but not in kind of a, an efficient way that's going to help me work through the problem uh, in a timely manner. Uh, and again, in addition to being potentially inefficient, some coping behaviors might actually make things worse. Um, think about drinking or other kind of substance use or abuse. And that's a way of coping with uh, the affect or dealing with the problem. Uh, avoiding the problem. That's a coping mechanism. Not a very good one, but it is a coping mechanism. So it's not just, are they, again, are they present or absent? It's, are they adequate or inadequate um, for, for this particular problem? Um, okay, so some combination of these balancing factors. You're going to think about these things, and depending on uh, what's there and what's missing, it's going to determine the person's ability to address the original problem, right? The original um, uh, originating event that that led to the crisis or might lead to a crisis. Excuse me. Um, so then, uh, if you address the problem, it's going to impact your equilibrium. So if you solve the problem, the assumption being now you can return to equilibrium. And if you don't solve the problem, you will stay in disequilibrium. Uh, and here it's important to note, I think, that um, it, it may be a new equilibrium, right? So you won't necessarily go back, go back to being the way you were before after resolution of this problem. Uh, it's simply a return to an acceptable level of functioning. And again, but it may be a qualitative, qualitatively different type of functioning, especially if you've kind of grown because of a crisis, and now maybe you're doing better, making different choices than you were before the crisis happened. So it's not just back to where you were, it's back to uh, uh, a, a, an equilibrium, not your original equi equilibrium necessarily. Um, okay, um, and then when that happens um, in Aguilar's model, that will determine your experience of crisis. So either crisis will be resolved or crisis won't be resolved. So we can think about this model in terms of when somebody's in crisis, think about it. We can also think about people being at risk for crisis. And um, if we intervene before kind of crisis mode uh, develops by um, kind of taking preventative efforts to address perception of the event, situational supports, and coping mechanisms, we might uh, better equip people to address problems and uh, move them more quickly to restoring equilibrium before uh, a full-blown crisis uh, evolves. Okay. Um, so that's the, in a nutshell, Aguilar's model. We'll spend a lot of time talking about it and applying it to different, um, different situations. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the process for intervention using Aguilar's model. Um, so we start off with assessment, and it's assessment of the individual and of the problem, with a lot of emphasis, more emphasis probably on uh, assessing the problem than uh, with kind of maybe more traditional therapeutic approaches. And uh, remember, this is a time-limited approach, so a second assessment will, will likely be largely informal and will also uh, occur uh, during or maybe a little bit before the first session. And by before, I mean doing any kind of records review, um, talking to the referral source if this person was referred to you, and finding out as much as you can before you have your contact with the person about um, what's going on and what's, what's led up to the crisis. Uh, things you want to ask about, you know, why are they coming to you? Um, to, you know, what was the precipitating event for the crisis? And make sure they un they understand that. Um, and usually the problem is something that happened within the last uh, week or two before they come in. And then ask them, you know, why did you come in today? You know, um, and the idea behind this is um, there's a problem, and uh, you wouldn't you don't, you wouldn't come in to see me if it was just you encountered some problem. There's some problem that you were unable to resolve on your own and trying to figure out why is that and what's their perception of why the problem led to a crisis. Um, so related to that, the things that uh, in Aguilar's model, the three bounce factors you want to assess for those. So what's the person's perception of the precipitating event? Um, in terms of situa situational supports, 
what things exist in their environment that support their ability to resolve the problem or what things might be missing. Uh, in terms of coping mechanisms, uh, what are they doing or have they done to solve the problem and uh, deal with the emotional consequences of the problem. Uh, and here you'll probably also be doing some uh, assessment in, in terms of risk of self-harm uh, as well because uh, self-injurious behaviors may be part of their way of coping. You know, thinking about, okay, well, it would be easier if I just weren't here anymore. That's a way of coping with uh, stress and psychological and sometimes even physical pain. Uh, so you may be doing some suicide assessment here as well, which we'll talk more about um, in the future. Okay, uh, and then from your assessment you'll develop a treatment plan. Uh, in uh, Aguilera's model is uh, more of an individual approach than a generic approach and we can say that because your treatment plan is based on the results of the assessment. Right. So it's not just, okay, somebody comes in and, I'll, and I know what I'm going to do with them before they walk in the door because I know that they you know, survived an earthquake and this is what you do with earth, earthquake survivors. This is, okay, what's going on with this person at this point in time? I'm assessing these things and then developing a plan um, based on what I learned in that assessment. Um, and again, even though I have assessment at the beginning, assessment uh, in therapy and in crisis intervention should be an ongoing process. Uh, so as you're planning, as you're intervening, you're always assessing, usually informally, um, what's going on with the client, what's working, what's not working, uh, and risk of, uh, of harm. Uh, and then, so, do a plan and then you, you uh, enact the plan, that you have the intervention. Um, and what you do will, um, will vary, but for, for Aguilera's model, you know, we're going to be doing something to help them uh, change the way they think about the problem, right, so addressing the perception of the event. Uh, we might be uh, educating them about resources or helping them find resources that may help them uh, resolve the problem. So in terms of situational supports, um, adding some, uh, maybe taking uh, some away that aren't helpful or helping them uh, make some that are present but not working, helping them figure out how to make those things work for them. Um, and then uh, in terms of coping, coping mechanisms, you know, help the person change what they're doing uh, about the problem. Um, so you'll have different ways uh, of doing that, which we'll, we'll talk about at length as we, as we go through. Um, and then, like I said, you're doing assessment all the way through, and then at, at the end, you're kind of going to book in this with assessment again and determine, you know, is the crisis uh, resolved. And again, this doesn't uh, necessarily mean that the person is no longer in need of therapy or intervention. It just means they're no longer in that crisis mode where they can't function. You've gotten them uh, out of that kind of danger period, and now, uh, you know, you might transition into therapy or you might refer them to therapy, depending on um, what setting uh, you're, you're working in. Okay. Um, so, uh, as we proceed through the semester, we'll talk about different types of crises and how the balancing factors that you might consider assessing and targeting for intervention uh, might differ across different types of crises, and we'll talk about um, um, more specifically what interventions uh, you'll use. Um, things I want you to be thinking about for our next uh, class discussion are um, how do the three uh, balancing factors uh, affect one another? So how does your perception of an event affect uh, your coping mechanisms you use? How do the coping mechanisms you use um, affect your ongoing perception of the event? Because again, your perception of the event isn't a, a static thing. It's dynamic. It will change over time, hopefully. I mean, that's one of our targets for intervention. So again, we hope it, it, it is subject to change. Um, so think about how these things relate to each other, and then also uh, think about examples of the balancing factors. You know, so um, how does the person perceive? How does the way a person perceives a problem uh, maybe put him or her at risk for a crisis or um, inoculate them against that risk? So what are kind of healthy, rational perceptions? What are some irrational types of perceptions for different uh, uh, events or problems? Um, in terms of situational supports. Um, which ones do you think are, are most important uh, to people or you know, are, do they differ across situations in terms of which types of supports um, are important? Um, and then lastly, um, in terms of coping behaviors, you know, what are some uh, adaptive coping behaviors that you think are generally good to encourage people to use? And maybe what are some maladaptive coping behaviors that you should be looking out for in your assessment and then maybe targeting for change in your intervention? Okay, uh, that's all for now. Uh, I'll see you all in class.